thanks for uh, joining us for how to make glue from macaroni, a special talk by John Grayson, and the book launch of Cinema Politica's first book, Screening Through to Power, a reader on documentary activism. We founded Cinema Politica here at Concordia, and with this event, we also mark the closing of our 10-year anniversary celebrations. We've gone a long way from our first screening in a small classroom somewhere in the whole building um, of anti-war film Come and See by Elam Klimov in September 2003 to regular screening series um, of, uh, dozen of hundreds of political documentaries on dozens of university campuses, libraries and communities across Canada and internationally. When we started showing political films, we never imagined Cinema Politica would turn into an expansive network um, of volunteer-run um, locals. Um, and it's actually all of these locals came together organically, mushrooming all over the world um, and all naturally fertilized by the passion, love, and commitment of activists, academics, and cinephiles. We're now proud of to call ourselves the largest volunteer-run campus and community documentary screening network in the world. Mm -hmm. And um, to substantiate this outlandish claim, I'll give you some stats. Um, currently, we have 70 Canadian locals on mostly on university campuses, but also in some communities and public libraries and 20 locals internationally. Our collection of films contains more than 600 films and we circulate all of these amazing political works all throughout the network. And to this day, we have held more than 3,000 screenings in locals on five different continents. Mm -hmm. So. Honestly, had no idea how this happened, but um, especially since we've been running everything on a shoestring budget. Um, but I'd like to say that we're extremely grateful to all of you for supporting us um, in this um, process. I see lots of friends, um, collaborators, uh, professors of ours, and whatnot. So thank you so much um, for being with us for these ten years. Here at Concordia, I'd like to thank um, all of our staff, incredible staff, Rachel, Lorenzo, and Tina, our tireless uh, volunteers, Lala, Elsa, Kay, Deandra, Anna, Mamun, Alexa, Kelly, Marina, and Manu, and our amazing interns this year, Florence, Sarah, Adam, and William, whose amazing work, dedication, and commitment is what makes CP happen. Cinema Politica extends beyond Concordia, and we'd like to acknowledge the hard work of all our uh, local organizers, filmmakers, event uh, guests and speakers, audiences, and of course, um, our amazing board of directors. I see a few of them here tonight. Tom Wa, Ines Lopez, Richard Bruyette, um, and a few more that are not here with us tonight, uh, Liz Miller, Pepita Ferrari, and uh, Michael Litko. So thank you all very, very much. The Cinema Politica website um, is a repository for the work we've been doing throughout the years. Um, it's an invaluable resource for political documentary films and an archive of some sorts. Um, so I invite you all to check it out if you haven't already. Visit the amazing Arby's pages featuring many of our Canadian and Quebec filmmakers with comprehensive uh, bios, artist talks, uh, filmographies, and uh, uh, select lists of their favorite Cinema Politica picks. Um, also our initiatives pages where we feature our adopted docs and special projects and our special events page which includes all of our special programming sidebars such as art docs, the commons and last but not least divine intervention. Um, this is a fairly new project of ours which explores the intersection between spirituality and social justice. So people keep on asking us when we are going to move online. And, uh, and we see that uh, there are certainly some merits to disseminating political work on the internet. However, we're still determined to keep showing films in material on the ground 
bonds in seed social spaces uh, because we still believe that the transformative um, potential of a political documentary increases dramatically when people are present. And when we bring together artists, activists, and audiences to not only raise awareness, but to also build connections and alternatives and ultimately take action. This brings me to the reason why we came up with the idea to put together a book. And I'll let Ezra tell you more about this. slideshow too distracting, should we turn it off? Um, okay, so why a book uh, and why this book? Um, clearly, as everyone knows, uh, the publishing industry has never been doing so well, so we decided to publish a book. Uh, yeah, we like to go against the grain. We're showing films uh, in social spaces, uh, material spaces, as Stella said, when everyone's going online. And when everyone's worried about the publishing industry, we decided to not only self-publish a book, but self-distribute. So thank you all for coming and each leaving with a, an entire case um, when you leave. Uh, but we wanted to, to, the reason why we wanted to do a book is because we've been doing cinema, working at Cinema Politica for 10 years. And after a decade, we realized what we've produced is a lot of events and we wanted to have something tangible, a cultural artifact and some interpretive material that brings together our three favorite spheres, which is art, activism, and academia, with an emphasis on the first two, at least in the book. Um, and so the book brings together a bunch of our favorite filmmakers, collaborators, some of our locals, um, and a whole bunch of different material all into one volume to this reader. Um, and in that regard, uh, we think also there's something in there for everyone. So there's some more academic -y essays, some favorite films lists, uh, some reflections from filmmakers, and all that. And it's been a labor of love, and we're so glad that the people who printed it right over there, Shadi and Savine, they just got it here, so it's still drying over there. Um, And, and the last uh, reason why we did the book is because we wanted to finally sit down and articulate what this thing is that we call documentary activism. And it only took us, I think, 6,000 words in our introduction. It's a bit long. Uh, it took a bit of explaining what documentary activism is, apparently, because it's this weird, you know, untangible thing. Uh, so, yeah, that's why we did the book. Yeah. I'd just like to mention uh, some of the contributors to the book that are hopefully here tonight. Um, we have um, Tom Wang, Sylvie Vabramba, Liz Miller, Ines Lopez, Kevin Lowe, John Grayson, Stefan Christoph, Jocelyn Clark, Karen Cho, Yang Chang, and Richard Briette. And I'd like to thank them like from the bottom of my heart for um, helping us put this project together. And also some of the um, people interviewed in the book, there are a few of them in attendance. Um, Sylvie Van Braba, yet again, uh, Alanis Obam Sawin, Alexandre Guité, and Wendy Champagne. So please take a moment to talk to them tonight, congratulate them, maybe ask them to sign your book um, as well. Um, so the book is mostly written in English, uh, but we, of course, recognize that we're also in Quebec. And, um, and that is, a, of course, a part of an extremely talented and committed Francophone um, community of filmmakers and activists. Uh, and we're very much appreciated of that opportunity to work here in Montreal. And as such, um, our board members, um, uh, we have one of our board members um, who's a founder of the first ever um, Francophone Cinema Politica Local, and actually the second Cinema Politica uh, Local, Cinema Politica UCAM, Ines Lopez, who um, has contributed an impressive chapter in French that consists of interviews with uh, 10 Quebecois filmmakers. Um, and it's a beautiful, beautiful um, contribution to our book. I'd like to invite Ines just to say a few words about that section. Hi everyone, bonsoir 
tout le monde. Je vais être avec vous pour le segment francophone de la soirée. Donc, euh, ben, merci d'être là. Vous êtes partie de la grande famille de Cinéma Politica. Euh, la plupart d'entre vous, j'imagine, vous avez compris, mais je vais quand même vraiment juste résumer la petite histoire du cinéma politique, du réseau. Donc, euh, avant d'être un réseau, c'était un ciné-club qui a commencé bien noblement ici à Concordia euh, en 2003, grâce à ce cher Ezra et cette chère euh, Svetla. Puis, euh, tout aussi humblement, en 2005, donc, on a recommencé notre euh, ciné-club à Lucan, le cinéma politique à Lucan. Et, euh, ben, dix ans plus tard, euh, 90 euh, ciné-clubs à travers le monde, donc 70 au Canada, 20 euh, ailleurs, euh, des ciné-clubs en espagnol, en portugais, il euh, y en a euh, en Indonésie, je crois qu'il y en a un qui s'en venait au Kenya. Mm -hmm. Et euh, donc, c'est ça, on est très, très, très content. Comme le disait Svetla, c'était un peu insoupçonné, cette envergure, c'était pas euh, initialement planifié, disons, mais on est très, très, très content euh, du constat. Euh, et un chapitre en français. Donc, pourquoi un chapitre en français? Pourquoi pas? Euh, à notre image, euh, le réseau, on voulait être représentatif, en fait, c'est, euh, à l'image du livre, un réseau qui est majoritairement anglophone, mais il y a également des ciné-clubs francophones, puis, euh, comme je le mentionnais, dans d'autres langues également. Euh, donc, il y a un article en français euh, qui s'intitule « Quels peuvent être les impacts sociaux du documentaire à travers euh, les yeux de 10 réalisateurs et réalisatrices? » J'aimerais d'ailleurs prendre le temps de les remercier brièvement. Euh, trois d'entre eux et elles sont avec nous ce soir. Donc, euh, merci beaucoup à euh, Malcolm Guy, Marie Botti, à Nicolas Boisclair qui est avec nous et Alexis de Gelder, euh, Sylvie Van Brabant qui est là aussi avec nous. Je l'ai vu tantôt. Allô Sylvie. Euh, merci à euh, Martin Bureau, Raymond Provencher, euh, Wendy Champagne, Alexandra Guité qui est avec nous également. Puis, euh, j'en oublie un, euh, Hélène Choquet aussi, euh, réalisatrice que j'aime beaucoup. Donc, euh, voilà, I will uh, say it in English uh, shortly. Um, there is an article in French in this book. If you wonder why, we said why not at our board meeting. We were like, we wanted to be representative, I guess, of um, the network. So we are, yes, indeed, um, mainly uh, an Anglophone network, but there, there, are, there are also locals in French, uh, Spanish, Portuguese, and other languages uh, throughout the world. And um, so the, the article in French is called the, What Can Be the Social Impacts of Documentary Through the Eyes of Ten Filmmakers? And I would like to thank them, same names, but I will say it once again real briefly. Um, Raymond Provencher, Martin Bureau, Alexandra Guité, which is with us. Uh, Nicolas Boisclair, Alexis de Gelder, and I might be forgetting a few, Malcolm. Sylvie Van Brabant, Malcolm, and Marie, Malcolm Guy and Marie Botti, which I really, really like also. <laughs> so thanks everyone for being here. You're all part of the big Cinema Politica family. Merci beaucoup tout le monde d'être là avec nous. Vous êtes partie de la grande famille de Cinema Politica. Bonne soirée. Uh, there is one chapter in French in the book, but there is also one smaller contribution in French, which is a list of ten very special films comprised by Richard Bruyet, and those are ten Quebecois films as well, so that segment is kind of like an appendix to the... Yeah. It's still in French. Um, so I hope uh, that you truly enjoy that. Um, he has some uh, quite amazing insights about the films he has listed in there. So, um, as the official launch of uh, Screening Truth to Power, a reader on documentary activism, tonight we're offering um, the reader at a special price of $14.95. So, um, grab a copy before you leave and please let your friends know they can purchase the book at cinemapolitica.org forward slash documentary activism book. And of course, this isn't just a book launch. We are delighted to have with us tonight an artist, activist, and educator, who's also recipient of the Cinema Politica Alanisa Bamsalin Award for Commitment to Community and Resistance, John Grayson. To introduce him, uh, I'd like to invite our board member and Concordia professor, Thomas Watt, to say a few words. Right? Yeah, great. Uh, 
Good evening, everyone. Je veux vous adresser en français tout d'abord parce que je ne veux pas que Inès soit se sente toute isolée. Et bienvenue tout le monde. It's a great honor for me to introduce my old friend John Grayson to you. I will I will be very brief, but we have been friends for 30 years. Can you believe it? I know he doesn't look that old, but I do, so you have to believe me. Um, John uh, was born a long time ago and <laughs> moved, <laughs> moved to Toronto as a teenage high school dropout in the late 1970s uh, and immediately hit the ground running as a, an apprentice artist, media artist, video artist, film critic, journalist, an activist, anti-censorship activist, anti a police violence activist, and uh, in the 1980s started to make his mark, making uh, video documentaries, experimental videos uh, about the issues of the day, about his own personal issues within the queer community and with the within the larger political spectrum of the day. And since then, he has made more than 60 works which is far too many. When we tried to make a book about him last year, uh, it turned out to be a very fat, expensive book, and they're, sell <laughs> they're selling it right there, so please buy several copies. Uh, we're very proud of this book as a tribute to this very uh, exemplary and uh, prolific and influential artist. He's not only a queer artist, He's not only a Canadian artist, he's really a global artist, a global citizen. Uh, many of us <coughs> this summer and this past fall watched the news every single day and the internet 10 times a day to see how he was doing, what the news was from his Cairo uh, prison cell. Um, it was uh, a very difficult time for John and Tarak, his friend and collaborator. Uh, after 50 days, we were all uh, relieved to hear the good news about his, his return to Canada with uh, Tarek. Uh, you might have thought that a survivor of that trauma might take some time off to uh, lick his wounds and process this terrible ordeal, not John. He hit the ground running and is now head of the graduate program in film production at, at York where he teaches uh, filmmaking. And not only that, he continued his activist and artistic career without batting an eyelash. And he is now very, he's going to talk a little bit about this, I think very much at the forefront of an international network uh, in solidarity with Egyptian political prisoners, uh, many of whom he shared his cell with for uh, 50 days. So he's a man that um, I admire greatly, an artist whose work teaches me something new every time I see it, and I've seen some of his films 20 times uh, every time I see something new, and it's a great uh, privilege and uh, honor to have a have him here tonight with us to hap help us celebrate this uh, 10th anniversary. So uh, from the depths of my heart, John, welcome. And, uh, Just so we don't forget, uh, after after we're done, there is a reception with drinks and snacks. <laughs> <laughs> so don't leave right after John's done. Yeah. We'll just switch off. Yep. And so making glue from your screening power to truth book. Oh, no. <laughs> making glue from macaroni. Yes. We're just getting the PowerPoint set up. Tom, thank you so much for an amazing, generous, uh, very moving introduction. Uh, thank you, Svetla and Ezra, for being who you are. This is an incredible celebration for, for all of us, 10 years of amazing activism and cinema. So I, um, I'm trying to 
help get our York chapter off the ground. We're real latecomers to the Cinema Politica family, but we're going to do better this September, I promise. They come to town and sort of harass us, so <laughs> it's uh, necessary. Toronto needs harassing. Uh, can you drag, can you, is it good? It's all good. Oh, nice. Oh, and making, yeah, making glue from macaroni prisons, ethics, portraits. Before we visit with Michelle, uh, Tarek does send his greetings. He's in London, he's back in the emergency room, also doing much activism uh, and speaking out himself. And he sends uh, his love to all and his thanks to all because we both know that many of you are involved in helping get us back, so thanks. Um, it, you'll be glad to know he's continued to work on both his 3D printing projects and his drones. So he's not giving up on any of that. The, en the Enlightenment which discovered the liberties also invented the disciplines. A month ago, Ali Mustafa and seven others were killed by a government bomb in Aleppo, Syria. A respected Toronto photographer, Ali was well known in solidarity circles and at York University as a tireless and generous activist. In 2010, Ali Mustafa and I shot a short boycott video edited by Kathy Gulkin documenting an action at the Ahava booth in the Eaton Center. Headquartered in an illegal Israeli settlement, Ahava makes skincare products from Dead Sea mud. Singing songs and sporting bathrobes and mud masks, we were soon thrown out by disgruntled Eden Center guards. <laughs> a year later, Ali was, in, was photographing the revolution in Tahrir Square. Among other subjects, he documented the emerging genre of graffiti portraits, commemorating those killed by army bullets. Portraits like these were some of the first things Tarek Lubani and I saw when we landed in Cairo on August 16th. The day dawned brightly with a gentle salty breeze blowing in from the sea. In his short video, Bashar, the Hostage Tapes, artist Walid Rad argues that market-driven hostage memoirs conform to predictable formulas. For instance, in his survey of Americans writing about their varied experiences of incarceration in Lebanon in the 80s, Rod noticed, notes that each of their bestsellers begins with a sentence about the weather. Mistrusting such formulas, I'll therefore resist the temperature to note that on August 16th, the sky above Cairo was a rich cerulean blue with scattered clouds drifting eastward. <laughs> Instead, I'll note that on, at 1.30, Tark Lubani and I were in Ramsey Square, hanging out near some anarchists waving a huge skull and crossbones banner. A crowd was gathering. The mood was tense but peaceful with small groups trading information about the massacres of Rabah Square on the previous two days. The army had arrested thousands and killed 600 unarmed protesters. A lone helicopter circled overhead. The, the faint smell of tear gas made us wander north towards the Nile. We heard a cry of doctor, doctor. A group of panicked young men appeared carrying a friend who was bleeding from a bullet wound to his neck. We learned later he'd been shot close to a police station, half a kilometer away. Tark rushed forward trying to staunch the flow. Someone suggested we carry the man across the street to the mosque. It was hard moving through the crowd, the growing chaos. Inside the mosque, Tark and the men laid him out on the carpet, on the green carpet, calling for bandages. Other bodies arrived also with bullet wounds. A young woman grabbed my arm, gesturing that I should film the wounds. Most Western doctors today still complete their training by swearing an updated version of the 2,000-year-old Hippocratic Oath. It famously lays out a set of shared principles for physicians. Respect patients' health, dignity and confidentiality, support human rights and liberties, do no harm. It's broadly understood that when someone calls doctor, a physician must answer the call. There, 
I had to get Rob Ford in there somewhere. <laughs> There's not yet a Hippocratic Oath for filmmakers, but there probably should be. Though the project of outlining a parallel set of ethics and responsibilities for folks with cameras would require much nuance. Balancing questions of dignity, confidentiality, and liberty with rights of expression, of dissent, of criticism. For instance, activist filmmaking practices, distinct from journalism, generally recognize that free speech and activist videos must sometimes include disrespect, perhaps especially of public figures, must sometimes violate some dignities and confidentialities, must indeed do some harm for the greater public good. This would be our Foucauldian challenge, a mandate that Ali Mustafa so brilliantly accomplished in his work. Here's a photograph from uh, Cairo um, uh, that he took uh, from Tahrir Square. Uh, the balancing of such First Amendment alibis while fully engaging with the power relations and privileges and responsibilities that come with focusing our lenses on the world around us as witnesses, as activists, as artists, as citizens. For Tarek and I, our own recent experiences of being on the other side of the cameras, navigating a sometimes hostile ma mass media gauntlet, acquainted us intimately with certain agendas of disrespect, <coughs> indignity, some minor harm perhaps. Thanks, Margaret Wenting. <laughs> However, such red couch pundits and their astringent headlines also helped remind us all of what was really at stake during our 50-day ordeal. Tonight, I want to address three ethical issues which emerged from our time in Signatura and that we continue to struggle with. One, how to represent a massacre. Two, how to navigate queer politics in a coup. And three, how to move forward from here. The ethics of representing a massacre. In discipline, it is the subjects who have to be seen. Their visibility ensures the whole of the power that is exercised over them. On the morning of August 17th, after a sleepless night in jail, we were randomly loaded into three paddy wagons, 40 per van, each designed to carry 24. The two bound for Signatura parked inside the prison walls and were left to bake for three hours in the sun. I learned a new word, hot box. We helicoptered our shirts as fans trying to move the air around. Five of the guys in our truck succumbed to heart heat stroke. The second truck fared worse because their ventilator grills were blocked. Like our truck, a number passed out from severe heat stroke. Suffering from extreme dehydration, some were forced to drink their own urine. Others shit their pants. Some prisoners in the third truck tried to resist. In retaliation, <coughs> uh, in retaliation, the guards locked them in and set up tear gas canisters. Unable to breathe, all 37 suffocated to death. <coughs> the guards then lit the truck on fire. When the families came the next day to retrieve their dead, the bodies were burned so badly that identification was impossible. Two weeks, late, two weeks ago, it's actually three weeks ago now, the trial of the four policemen responsible resulted in suspended sentences. When we heard this story and realized how random dumb luck had landed us in the first truck and not the second or third, we kept remembering what we'd witnessed in the mosque. When we were unloaded from our truck and, su and subjected to Signatory's welcome party, a ritual beating by the guards, with us, quote, foreign terrorists, Tarek and I, singled out for special punishment, we remembered the mosque. When our detention without charges was extended to first 10, then 15, then 30, then 45 days, we remembered the mosque. Nothing we endured came close to the horror of that makeshift field hospital that first day, when the bodies kept arriving, screaming in agony from bullet wounds to their chests and neck necks and heads. Nothing came close to the futility we felt, Tarek unable to save lives because he was lacking the most basic of medical supplies, 
me with my camera attempting to bear inadequate witness to the wounds while they died in front of my lens. The prosecutor's office still has all my footage, but we knew that there had been other photographers in the mosque that day. For instance, Elisa Iannacone, a former student of mine from York and now an acclaimed photojournalist who shot this image. It was extraordinary. We were both in the mosque together. I knew she was in Cairo, but didn't know she would be there shooting. And though the mosque was quite huge, it still amazes us both that we didn't see each other in the, in the hour that we crossed over. She left many hours before we did, but uh, it was surprising. Bike lights, every time. Bike uh, lights, uh, bike uh, lights, uh, bike uh, lights uh, make the world better. <laughs> During the second week of our incarceration, whoop, let's get that back. Uh, yeah, yeah. During the second week of our incarceration, when we finally secured a pen and some paper, I found myself trying to think of ways to speak of this nightmare we'd witnessed. For many years, I've been intrigued by how old pop songs with new lyrics can tra subversively transmit radical politics. For instance, I've recruited Elton John, Justin Bieber, most recently Stevie Wonder, to sing, quote unquote, about boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Could the same be done for August 16th? The song I chose, I, I don't have that, I don't know that many lyrics off by heart. The song I chose was a rockabilly anthem from the Smiths' legendary 1986 album, The Queen is Dead. Vicar in a Tutu became Cairo in a cuckoo. Mm -hmm. And then second verse, CC is a cuckoo, etc. We smuggled the lyrics out to our lawyer in Tark's underwear. The words were scanned and sent to my longtime partner in cover version crimes, Toronto composer Dave Wall, who essayed a spot on impersonation of Morrissey. The video was edited by the brilliant Andrew Bartlett, following the template we'd used for our Stevie Wonder project and using YouTube footage from the mosque that he'd sourced online. The plan was to release the video the minute our plane back to Canada lifted off the runway. The intention was honorable on all our parts, an attempt to mobilize pop irony to condemn the coup. But in fact, the result was a queasy, insurmountable collision of rockab rollicking rockabilly and human suffering. Artistically, politically, especially ethically, the video failed to navigate the difficulties of representing the complexities of the Egyptian reality and the August 16th massacre. Khalid Abdullah, the Cairo activist featured in The Square and a co-founder of the Mosarine Media Activist Collective, made the most cogent critique. He, he said, it perpetuates the fiction of a two-dimensional binary the army versus the Muslim Brotherhood. Whereas in reality, the coup was much more complex and many-sided. We shelved the video. During the five days of lockdown in Cairo's airport Novotel, waiting for a no-fly status to be lifted, we had many conversations with Khalid about the extraordinary difficulties of representing this coup and this coup's atrocities, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the medium of short, YouTubeable video clips. The, for those of you who don't know, uh, you should all go check out Moserine's um, website. Hundreds of brilliant short pocket documentaries all uh, available and uploaded, um, and some very recent ones on the current situation. Extraordinary work. Contradictions concerning the collusion of civil society, a genuine mass movement of 20 million in the streets, with an army, with the army, in the toppling of the Morsi government don't easily lend themselves to the soundbite language of Ajiprav. Mosarin, a collective born of the Tahrir Square 2011 revolution, has found its own hands tied post-coup, with any attempt at speaking out inevitably instrumentalized by either the Muslim Brotherhood or the army. In ways distinct from Cairo and Akuku, they'd also ethically, artistically, politically lost their tongues or at least had their tongues silenced by, this, by the particular nature of this moment, this August moment, this coup. In late November, 
They broke their self-imposed silence. The army was inaugurating a memorial to the martyrs of the 2011 revolution, unarmed civilians the army itself had slaughtered. I'm not sure if this is unprecedented when an army itself builds a, a monument in the public square to people it's killed only two years before. Uh, but certainly it was met with outrage. Within six hours, the memorial was covered in outrage graffiti, and most Serene cameras were there to document it. I'm not going to play it now. Um, our sound isn't, uh, isn't terrific tonight. The army's response was swift and brutal. While in turn, President Mansour enacted new draconian law, effectively banning mass demonstrations, police detained 81 of Egypt's best known secular campaigners, including members of Mossarine. Despite pretenses at lifting curfew, the repres repression of the current military dictatorship is deepening. But despite that, as I said, Mozarine has very much found their voice again, they're back in action, and the, the new tapes are some of the most extraordinary and powerful. Uh, really highly recommended. The ethics of navigating queer politics during a coup. The soul is the effect and instrument of a political anatomy. The soul is the prison of the body. Tarek first approached me to accompany him to Gaza because he knew I was working with Queers Against Israeli Apartheid on anti-occupation solidarity projects in concert with some Palestinian queer groups. He was keen to have conversations on the topic with folks he knew on the ground in Gaza, fellow doctors, artists, feminists. How ironic then that in Signatora, I found myself climbing back in, the, in my closet after 35 years of being very out and very outspoken. Here in Toronto, my boyfriend Stephen, Cecilia, here in Toronto. There in Toronto, <laughs> my boyfriend Stephen, who's here tonight, Cecilia, who, my sister who's in Halifax, Tarek's brother, Mohammed from London, Ontario, and Justin, Justin Poder, and the core team of campaigners worked mostly successfully to push my fairly public sexuality back in the closet for the duration. And these headlines right here are actually the exception to the general rule of mainstream media compliance, respecting the very real dangers of homophobic backlash. Tark and I twice asked our lawyers if my sexuality, in fact, might be useful in disproving the prosecutor's obsessive conviction that we were Hamas agents. I mean, really, if Hamas can't do better than this, like, come on. But the lawyers rightly argued back that that would be the stupidest thing we could do. A common sense, ta it was a con a, maybe a common sense tactic, but useless in the face of the wildly irrational charges we were facing and the wildly irrational court we were up against, court and prosecutor we were up against. The delicacy of this question ironically encouraged right-wing Zionists, like Wente and Levant, to suddenly become born-again champions of gay rights scolding us for supposedly cuddling up to homophobic Islamists in Gaza. It's an accusation that of course, that's of course premised on widespread Western fantasies about the supposed homophobic brutality of Middle Eastern societies and Mid Middle Eastern prisons in particular. It's of course essential to remember the Egyptian courts and prisons were explicit products of French colonialism and Napoleonic law. And thus it's more accurate to analyze Torah's prison methods of disciplining and punishing us through the lens of Foucault's institutional critique of the French penal system than engaging in any fantasies, or fantasies, and, uh, uh, fantasies about uh, Middle Eastern prisons. The more relevant question to navigate, would I come out if I was locked up in La Santé prison in Paris, Millhaven in Kingston, or Bordeaux here in Montreal? I'm not sure. It's certainly true that the entrenched homophobia of the Egyptian state institutionalized under Mubarak has worsened with the coup. In October, an underground sauna in Cairo's El Marg district was raided and 14 men were arrested for committing homosexual acts. On November 19th, censors cut 13 scenes depicting hints of gay desire from Hani Fazi's new film, Family Secrets scenes that the censor under Morsi's Islamist government had passed. It's also true that Hamid Sino, 
the very out and very queer lead singer of the Lebanese alt band Mashru Leila, publicly campaigned for our release, along with other queerish activists and groups in Egypt and throughout the Middle East, including Palestinian queers for BDS. In other words, navigating the full spectrum of diverse queer discourses in the Middle East requires much more nuance than the opportunistic agendas of pinkwashing Zionists. This is the floor plan of our cell, as imagined by my brother Peter, based on the actual dimensions, three meters by 10 meters. And note the toilet in the corner, there actually was walls around it, a, a stall for privacy. There was a, also a cold water tap uh, in, the, uh, in the toilet, in the small closet there. The possibilities for privacy were non-existent. Floor space became the most closely coveted commodity. In this sardine can shoebox that often felt like a CIA deprivation experiment, how did the 38 of us actually coexist without killing one another? We ran classes. I, lead an I led an English con conversation group and studied calligraphy. We took turns giving lectures. Tark soon tired of doing talks on medicine and ventured into politics one night offering up his analysis of the Sunni Shia split. Mm -hmm. A dead silence greeted his effort, followed quickly by a near unanimous vote. No more political topics at evening <laughs> lectures. They asked me to talk about my work as a filmmaker, and it was a challenge since almost all my films address issues of queer politics. I found myself, I found myself degained the three features I've made that are prison love stories and describe them instead of ta as tales of religious intolerance, lilies, which uh, I shot uh, here in Montreal, anti-colonial resistance, Proteus, which was uh, done in South Africa, and state bureaucracy, uncut, shot in rural Ontario. I also uh, told them, told my fellow prisoners that that's the way Canadians do it. First we make the films, then we do the field research. <laughs> We prayed. Well, they prayed, and I'd have a shower, being an atheist, uh, which consisted of filling a sawed-off Fanta bottle full of Nile water from our tap and dumping it over my head. Abdul Aram, our prayer leader, has one of the most beautiful tenor voices I've ever heard, melodious and melancholic. When he sang, and when the afternoon sunlight made the Fanta bottles on the windowsill near the ceiling glow like stained glass, we achieved for a brief moment, a collective respite, a state of grace. We learned how to make prison glue. Boil down half a kilo of dry macaroni into a viscous batter. Add three tablespoons sugar, ferment in a Fanta bottle for three days. Use, use to attach fabric squares torn from prison blankets securely to the wall. Attach rope loops and hooks made from scraps of wood. This superglue is strong enough to support the weight of a grown man. Ibrahim demonstrated it by hanging off one of the hooks. On the second night we were in prison, they asked us to talk about our work in Gaza. Tarek decided that we should end with a song, and his choice was, for reasons known only to him, que sera sera. <laughs> our fellow prisoners took up the chorus, and for the rest of our stay, it became a mantra of endurance a code phrase for surviving our ideal. When I'd come back from one of our lawyer visits, depressed by news of another extension, inevitably one of the prisoners would come over to console me, proffering a comforting arm. Oh, John, que sera, sera. <laughs> Indeed, it, soon deftly, it, it was soon deftly translated into inshallah, shallah. <laughs> As weekly family visits commenced and family members discovered the vigorous online campaign fighting for our release, curiosity about us increased. Tark and I became convinced that I would soon be outed, since anyone Googling my wiki page gets clobbered pretty quick with gay content. Indeed, Moham, or indeed Mahmoud came back from one family visit and scolded Tark and I, saying that for the entire 20 minutes, his son did nothing but talk about the free Tark and John campaign. His son had Googled all my films and claimed pointedly, I know your, your friend John better than you yourself do. <laughs> what was being left unsaid here between the lines? 
Ahmed, who slept beside me, a call center operator for Expedia Canada with excellent English, often made pointed hints about my seeming, seemingly inexplicable biography. Age 53, unmarried, two teenage daughters, a Smiths fan. Yet, the point blank question was never asked and my option for coming out was never exercised. The delicate balance of our community relied on all of us navigating complex geographies of trust and discretion. This maintenance of certain symbolic distances became a necessary part of our collective cohabitation, especially because we all slept together every night like sardines. The ethics of what's next. Disciplinary power is exercised through its invisibility. At the same time, it imposes on those whom it subjects a principle of compulsory visibility. At 2 a.m. on October 6th, Tarek and I were fingerprinted and discharged from Signatora. We were given back our street clothes, our bank cards, our passports, and a range of responsibilities, ironically in repudiation of the state's interpolation of voluntary visibility. First, responsibilities to the thousands who worked so hard to free us. There's Jordan with the megaphone. Thanks so much for the, for the pipes. There's Manon, who is, uh, I, just, I just have to say, thank you, hey, Manon. That was a, a very nice way to arrive in Montreal for Manon's victory. So, um, uh, let's see. Um, it took your stubbornness and dedication and ingenuity to release us from the clutches of Sisi's terrifyingly arrogant regime, seemingly indifferent to world opinion. From the bottom of our hearts, from Tarek and I, thank you. This is a video, the, I, the audio's gonna be, a, it'll, it'll be okay. And um, it's, uh, it was made, we did that inconvenient thing of getting out a few days too early. So my, my wonderful friends, the video collaborators who made this, had to go back to the drawing board and re-edit. And uh, so this is what they came up with. It's a, a tribute to not only what was accomplished, the incredible groundswell, but also what's next. Second, we had a responsibility to our fellow prisoners. In the five months since our release, 40 of the 600 arrested on August 16th have also been released, including eight from our cell. The rest, 540, remain behind bars. And of course, two weeks ago in Minya, 529 of those arrested in the same period in early August were sentenced to death after a 15-minute trial. We're trying as much as possible to network with the prisoners we were locked up with in the family and their families, which in my case involves struggling with the monstrous inadequacies of Arabic Google translation, very bad. Beyond our former cellmates, there's the obvious ethical question of where to draw the line. Why not advocate on behalf of those thousands arrested on August 14th and 15th, or for that matter, the 16th, the 16,000 currently in prison, political prisoners currently in prison in Egypt. As much as possible, we're trying to follow the lead of such folks as Mosarim on the ground in Cairo, and also the Egyptian Canadian Coalition for Democracy here in Montreal. We all share a responsibility for keeping eyes on Egypt and for speaking out against Sisi and his thugs. Bit, a bit blown out, hard to see. I'm working on portraits right now of my cellmates using a Garmin runner's watch, which records the GPS location of where I run. Here are portraits of Masri, who was teaching me calligraphy, of Ahmed, the Expedia Canada call center operator. I create a route superimposing the drawings I did of them in prison onto a different part of, of Toronto that bears some reference to their own life. For instance, with Masri, his brother-in-law is an archaeologist at the Cairo M Museum, so I created a route which ran past the Rome at the, the Royal Ontario, uh, Toronto's Royal Ontario Museum. Then I run and record them, transferring them to Photoshop. 
Third, we have a responsibility of visibility to speak out on behalf of wrongful detentions everywhere. In early November, Tarek and I visited the Lindsay Detention Center in Ontario, met with a number of prisoners who are being held without charges while awaiting possible deportation. One case in particular upset me deeply. He was born in Sri Lanka, came to Canada when he was nine, is now 29, has two kids, and was, report, was deported back in early December, back to a country he hasn't seen since he was a boy, back to a culture he doesn't know, a language he doesn't speak. He's bisexual and was worried he'd face discrimination and violence. Fourth, we have a responsibility of visibility to continue to mobilize around Gaza, now under even greater siege in the wake of the coup. The Rafa gate between Gaza and Egypt is more often closed than open, and the tunnels have all at least officially been bulldozed. Tarek wants you to know that, the last, that last winter and spring, Gaza had an average of 25 foreign doctors visiting per month. Since the coup, that number has dropped to zero. Two weeks ago, a delegation of Code Pink activists traveling to Gaza through Cairo were detained, harassed, and then deported. The Egyptian airport police jailed co-founder co -founder Medea Benjamin overnight, dislocating her shoulder. Uh, here's her being taken into custody. Uh, if I had to draft a Hippocratic Oath for filmmakers, it would avow that, like Mosserine, cameras bring with them both privileges and responsibilities, visibilities, both to create and to witness, but equally to critically deconstruct and take apart and actively question practices of representation. If I had to draft an oath for activists, it would avow, like the Free Tarek and John campaign, that effective social change embraces nimble tactics and surprising alliances and critical inventive strategizing. If I had to draft an oath for Lebanese queer activist musicians doing nuanced Morrissey cover versions of Que Sera Sera in Arabic that speak to complex Middle Eastern queer realities, I phone Hamad Sino. When we returned to Canada, Tark and I thanked Stephen Harper and John Baird for helping secure our release, but we had no illusion about their agenda. Our case was a band-aid, a placebo, a convenient way for them to seemingly speak out about Egypt while never actually saying the coup word. As they continue to cozy up to Sisi's regime, their deafening shameful silence regarding Mohamed Fahmy remains a scandal. Mohamed Fahmy, a respected Canadian journalist who has worked for CNN, the New York Times, and Al Jazeera, has now been locked up in Torah in a cell nearer to ours for 84 days, well, for uh, actually 100 days yesterday, 101 days today. His trial on ridiculous charges continues this Monday. Uh, right now, Pam Rogerson and I are running a portrait of him broken up into six different chunks. Like so many, we worry of, as his farcical show trial continues, a charade exploited by General Sisi to silence criticism and help consolidate his military dictatorship. Sovereignty is exercised within the borders of a territory. Discipline is exercised on the bodies of individuals and security is exercised over a whole population. Portraits can exercise an ethical resistance to tyranny, however small, however symbolic. There's the six chunks of Mohammed Fahmy's portrait. Um, again, a bit blown out. Drawing the likeness of a friend or a stranger with a camera or a silk screen, with a smuggled pen, with a GPS watch, with your feet, declares through graphic acts of solidarity the agency of portraiture, declares their agency as people, their individuality, their, vi their visibility on their own terms and not the state's. In terms of building community and solidarity, portraits can function as a kind of super glue glue made of macaroni. There's the hashtag. The, the, um, Al Jazeera has launched a global campaign asking everyone to tweet a selfie with holding up this uh, a piece of paper with this hashtag on it, trying to uh, sh demonstrate uh, thousands of uh, in solidarity with Mohammed. 
So I urge you all to grab your cell phone, uh, print up that, write up the hashtag on a piece of paper and post it. These are portraits by Shirin uh, Nishat, the Iranian artist who went to Cairo uh, recently and took these portrait faces of ordinary Egyptians uh, experiencing, living through the coup. Um, you, it, this, this photo doesn't show, but there's incredibly fine lettering. Uh, poem, poems have been written on their faces. Uh, poems by uh, the, uh, Egypt, uh, pardon me, the uh, Persian uh, poet Mehdi Akhaven Salad. These are works by the Argentinian artist, portrait works by the Argentinian artist Oscar Munoz. Uh, on the uh, uh, painting the faces of those disappeared during their coup. On the left, you see him painting on a hot Buenos Aires sidewalk in water. And as he paints, the water makes first a dark impression and then evaporates. So these are constantly disappearing portraits of the disappeared. On the right, there's, he's done portraits using a, a graphic grid system sugar cubes dipped in coffee. So different, uh, you know, espresso for the blacks, uh, cappuccino for the grays, and, and leaving the um, uh, blocks of sugar white. Again, portraits of the disappeared. I'm gonna end uh, tonight with a portrait of Ali Mustafa. Um, Ali, a, a week, not even a week, I think four days after Ali was killed in Syria, uh, his friend Omar Hamilton, one of the Moserine Collective, uh, got another friend, uh, the graffiti artist uh, Omar Fati, and they uh, paint. Omar Fati painted this portrait, and Omar Hamilton uh, filmed it at great risk. To sh to pull out your camera in Cairo is really uh, not very possible, but they did this a few weeks ago to, uh, through portraiture, honor the memory of Ali Mustafa. So before we get up and stretch our legs, we do have time for just a few questions or comments for John, if anyone has any? So repeating the question, uh, did we ever have a, were we ever able to see a doctor? And luckily we had a doctor, <laughs> but he was all locked up with us. So we did have, we did have access, unlike Mohammed, who's had a, a bad arm for his entire hundred days so far, and they won't let him see proper medical care. Um, he's seen a doctor, but not proper medical care. We were able a couple times to access doctors, and it was minor complaints. We, it was sort of amazing. We didn't have, uh, nobody in our cell had too much bad medical stuff. Other cells did, but not us. Tark, whenever we went out in the exercise yard, Tark would be trying to exercise, but it would be like this, the, the guys from all the other cells would come with their elbows and their, you know, stuff. And he's, you know, he's, he's got to do it, yeah. So he didn't get much exercise. And there were some, there were some scary cases. There was um, a guy with uh, a very badly infected broken leg that was also infected and it was going towards gangrene and probably would need amputation, et cetera. It was just, and they, complaints were made constantly in Tark in particular because the, the guards knew he was a doctor and still. You know, because that was a, you know, that was a drug, drug guy, you know, criminal, so. Um, both of us went back to work right away, and I think that was healthy. People said, oh, take your time, and my department at my university was generous. They let me do a sort of <laughs> gradual, uh, but it's been pretty full time since November, uh, and that's been good trying to get back to my own work, all the, the, the a bunch of projects that I'd left behind last summer, and that's been really hard. I haven't had much success. 
And then there's been a lot of obligations in terms of uh, prisoner justice stuff here in Canada, the Egyptians, uh, the Egyptian situation. Uh, it's pretty, it's pretty ongoing. So that's that's been uh, hard to navigate. Uh, public response, especially official government response for Mohammed Fami, has been the worst ever. And what can we do? What can we do more? This is the campaign that Al Jazeera is asking us to do. Hashtag free AJ staff. And it's easy and it's fast and we all should do it. And then we all should contact Harper and Baird. And I think it's very clear that there, uh, you know, never has there been a journalist more mainstream. He worked for the New York Times. He worked for CNN. He's got the support and backing of journalists around the world and editors, in fact. There isn't a shortage of press when you Google his case. The, the crisis is at a political level, and you see the contrast. The Australian government has pulled out the stops, and you know, the Australian Prime Minister is speaking out forcefully and, and intervening very, very effectively, and Harper and Baird are twiddling their thumbs and playing footsie with Sisi. So I think uh, it's, it's uh, you know, beyond those, beyond those two uh, suggestions, I think we've all got to go and figure, we've all got to work on those avenues and those routes. I think the, the crucial thing, when Tarek and I got back and were debriefing with my sister and with Stephen and with Justin and Mohammed, we were, you know, we, we were trying to analyze what worked, what was the thing that made a difference. And it was the, the uh, thousand butterflies that, you know, flap, each butterfly flapping their wing in a different way. And it was, but it was cumulative, and there was. I, I think the cumulative will will prevail in Mohammed's case too. His family's on the ground in Cairo, and they're getting the worst runaround. And their 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 strategy has been to be more stealth, on their you know dip quiet diplomacy, and that's you know that's a valid choice, and that's their strategy. And in turn, we have to find you know and. Al Jazeera has their strategy. We've got to find ours. Thank you, John, for speaking. Thank you. Uh,